Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd, and um, next week we have Dan Weld from the University of Washington. He's done a lot of interesting work in AI and machine learning and is looking at how that interaction between human and machine learning. Um, this week we have somebody who is an expert on learning. Um, and I guess to put it in context, I often and increasingly nowadays because of what's going on in the industry, get people coming by and saying, I have this great idea for how to educate using computers. Uh, and they've got what's potentially often a very interesting piece of computer technology, but they really don't have any idea how it relates to real learning as opposed to sort of the image of learning we have if we have a kind of computer science attitude. So uh, it's very good to have Dan Schwartz here today from the School of Education where they actually study learning. Uh, and he's done a lot of work over the years. So here's a lunch we're discussing in particular. He's done some interesting work on what he calls teachable agents, where you have students learn by teaching the computer. Okay, it's the old adage, you learn best when you teach something. We all, those of us who are in the business know that. Um, today is he gonna be talking on different things, but it's really in the same vein of how do you use computers in a way that actually supports learning objectives as opposed to just sounding like a good, good kind of program to do. Um, so with that, Dan Schwartz. Thank you. I think I'm good. So uh, <clears throat> I'm actually not going to talk about learning. So I apologize. I'm, I'm going to talk about testing. And the reason is I think uh, tests are just taking over your lives and they make you think you know what counts as learning and it's wrong. And so I'm not going to talk a lot about computers until the end. I figured this is a good time for me to talk about what I know, not what you know. So, so the, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to do is sort of talk a little bit about the tension of HCI in education and then uh, try and convince you that assessment is really important. And so this is a bit of a manifesto talk, right? I'm, I'm going <clears> to <throat> ignore the detail and just hammer the point. And I'm going to try and convince you that assessment is distorting what people think counts as good learning. And then I'm going to say what assessment should look like. And then I'm going to tell you the fundamental assumption behind current assessments, which I think is wrong. And then I'm going to give you an alternative. And then finally, I'm going to start to show you what we're trying to do about it. And this is where I think HCI could do a tremendous amount to help. So <clears throat> I think designing instruction is not a natural for uh, HCI or computer scientists. Uh, in particular, there's a kind of a learning versus performance tension that HCI wants to improve the ease of use so people can perform better. And education often wants to make things hard to use, right? So a little bit of struggle. So here's a good example. You want to teach fractions to kids. You're going to use pies or tiles, right? Well, if you're HCI or just about everybody, you'd think pies, of course, because they just they make it so obvious, right, that it's fractional. Turns out uh, pies are much worse for learning, that if you teach kids fractions with pies, it doesn't go anywhere, it just stays with pies. So what, what works for performance can often undermine learning. <clears throat> so I think instructional design may not be a perfect fit for HCI, and I've had this conversation many times. Uh, I do think there are places where HCI can do a lot for instruction. So removing pain points would be a great one. Uh, I think I've, one of the greatest pain points is rational numbers, right? And I think HCI could improve the notation of rational numbers, and it would save billions of hours and trillions of dollars where, so that most of fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade are not spent overcoming these confusions. Like one half means one thing and two things as opposed to one half. Or a very common one, 0.2 versus 0.10, and kids think 10 is more than 2. Or 100% means 100 times. So I tell you, if HCI would take on this problem, you would, the gross national product would go up. Right? The amount of time we spend just because somebody came up with these stupid representations is very high. But I have a different task for you. Uh, and this is to improve tests. And so I'm going to argue why and then how we can do it. 
So <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to give, remind you what it's like to be a kid taking a test. And so kids' view of learning based on these tests is probably different than the people who decide what should be learned. So <clears throat> there's a lot of standards out there. There's like <laughs> national standards. There's state standards. Very thoughtful uh, bodies get together to decide what is important to learn. And they're often a good vision of useful learning. Somewhere along the line, the standards then get translated into assessments. And all sorts of monkey business occurs here. And so children see these assessments, not the standards. They see the tests. So let's see what the message the kids are getting. <clears throat> so here's a California standard for US history, 11th grade. This is a pretty profound kind of standard. It's covering a lot of ground. Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, so what I want you to do in your head is predict the question that's on the test that me measures whether students have learned this standard. What, what kind of assessment would you create? So down at the bottom here is the standard. Here's the first half of the assessment. And here's the part that the kids do. So if I do well on this, I, I have achieved the standard. If I do poorly, I have failed at that standard. So this, this is kind of uh, awful. Let's take a look at another one. <clears throat> I'm going to show you the test item, and you guess what the standard is. I always want to choose clams. I, I, they just seem really important to me. But. OK, so again, at the bottom is the question. You're trying to think of what was the standard. Right, so there, again, there's been this terrible distortion. Right, the, whoever made this assessment did pyramid, and that's all they noticed. So uh, these, this sort of mismatch causes a double problem. One is, for the adults, the information flowing back from these tests is misaligned with their intent. And I don't think the policymakers know this. They're unaware, unless they've taken a test likely, lately. I doubt a senator has done that recently. Uh, for the kids, and this is really my concern, is assessments provide the raw data for what counts as useful learning. So as a teacher, I can tell them you should have deep understanding. You should have passion. You know, maybe I even just tell them, look, you've got to learn algebra. You have to to get through college, you know, whatever. Uh, but whatever I tell them, it's going to be trumped by the evidence that they get. So here's a great, a great graph. Um, every, <clears throat> every couple of years, there are international tests. The TIMS is the third international mathematics science survey. And it goes out, and different countries all take the same test. And over here is the average science score. And so I've made things a little blurry, so you can't quite see where your nation resides. Uh, but I'll let you see. Here's the United States, sort of middle of the pack. What's interesting about this is this dimension is the percentage of students who have positive attitudes towards science within each nation. So you probably can see the negative correlation. The better, your, the better your nation does, the less students want to do science. The worse your nation does, the more they want to do science. Here's the same thing uh, for math. This is your math country score. And then there's scale as I like math. It didn't say nope and yup, but you get the idea. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's possible explanations for this. You know, It may be some sort of bizarre statistical artifact. It may be that kids at top countries are seeing more kids above them, and so it, makes, it hurts their self-concept, and they want to engage less. I think the, the easiest interpretation is these kids who do well in these countries study for tests like this. They see what that means, and they don't like it, so they don't want to do that. So their vision of what science and math is is basically being driven by preparing for these tests. And it's just not a good image, right? In your science class in high school, you don't do science. You do test prep. So uh, assessment is 
uh, a very big tail that wags the dog. Um, so this is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, I don't know if people know this. This is a very famous thing that came out of a committee in the 50s. Uh, it says knowledge at the bottom. You'd sort of think knowledge is at the top, right? But actually what they meant by knowledge is memory retrieval. So it's just basically with facts, facts. And so Bloom's taxonomy is, was interpreted as lower order thinking skills and then go to higher order thinking skills. And this, uh, this is an assessment framework. Right? This was designed for assessment. It was not designed for instruction, yet it's the single most influential framework for instruction. Whether in industry and in schools, they all follow Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, it's utterly incorrect about learning. Right? The, the idea that you would look, get comprehension without having to do some analysis to get comprehension just can't be right. right? It's just it's, it doesn't fit by any theory. Right? Yet, it is incredibly pervasive. It's the power of assessment to shape what we think and how we teach. Another example is teaching the test. This one's a little more obvious. You know, if you were a teacher and you didn't teach the test, you're kind of crazy, right? Because everybody's going to know your kids are doing badly, the parents are mad, the principal's mad. Kids are happy, they probably learn more. But uh, No Child Left Behind was a, a good idea. It was just sort, sort of on the assumption if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So it put a lot of uh, measures in schools. The problem is all the measures are kind of bad. Right? They were done very quickly. The result is, is that it's distorting instruction. The teachers are teaching to this test, which they should, but it's a bad test that they're using. And so there's a lot of complaints about this. And of course, if you were a student, you'd be crazy if you didn't study with the test in mind. And so we, we run into this problem all the time. Instructional formats end up looking like test formats. Like, why the best way to practice is word problems, I have no idea, except that word problems are easy to put on a test. So now our instruction involves a bunch of word problems. Um, it's not a great idea. Teaching physics, so we've gone in and taught sections of physics here in the physics department. And uh, we see that the students do better based on our instruction. But the Stanford student response is uh, pretty stereotypical. This is not what the problems look like on the test. Right? So they want their instruction to match what the test looks like. Even though the way we're teaching them will get them to do better on the test. They want the match. So what's the problem with current tests? I've tried to make the argument that these things are incredibly influential on what people think counts as learning. They're very influential about instruction. What's wrong with them? So uh, I think current assessments have a common format that, that causes a lot of trouble. And the format is uh, sequestered problem solving. So you take a test, like a jury, the test takers are protected from contamination, right? You don't, you don't want them to talk to anybody, learn anything during the test, because that would make the test, you know, it's not a good measure anymore. And uh, so that's, it's sort of odd because, you know, like in computer science, which is particularly notorious about its approaches here, you know, if you collaborate on a test, maybe even a homework assignment, that's absolutely violating the value of that test. Of course, if you're in industry and you don't quite know the answer and you don't talk to someone and collaborate, you're a fool. But on a test, you get sequestered. So these assessments are really appropriate for efficient retrieval and application. You sit down, it's you, it's a piece of paper, it's a pencil. It's how fast can you remember something and get it down quickly, accurately, basically replicating what you did before. And they're very good for certain things where you need that kind of efficiency, like decoding letters, decoding words. You see the word breakfast. You want to be able to do that very fast, right? If you do it slowly, you're going to it'll be a bottleneck in your ability to read. But also, reading really depends on a very stable environment. Words are always left to right, right? They tend to have breaks between each of them. So you can train people to a high degree of efficiency on this. And you want them just to retrieve it fast, get it quick. So this is where SPS assessments, sequestered tests, are good because that's what they measure. The SAT is this kind of test. It's time pressured, right? You don't get a chance to get feedback in the middle of the test, right? They just want to see how fast can you remember it and apply it. So there's a lot of areas where this is appropriate. Fact families, 3 times 4 is 12, 6 times 2 is 12, 12 divided right, 6 is 2. Um, problem is these tests can often be misleading. So for kids, they think learning equals memorizing. 
And so you see they also lead to strange beliefs, like smart equals performance without any help or resources. Yeah, I got an A on the test without studying. You know, that, that sort of attitude. Asking for help is a mark that you're not quite as smart. Uh, I think for evidence for decision-making adults, one of the problems with these sequester tests is they're static retrospective measures. They're asking what the kid learned, and what we really want is a prospective measure. What will the kid be able to learn? That's sort of what we care about more. So let me give a thought experiment where a sequestered test might be misleading. Uh, there's two candidates applying for a job at the mega corporation. Bob took a five-week Excel course, right? Uh, Mike did not, but he has taught himself three other spreadsheet programs. So the mega corporation wants to give an entrance test, and the company uses Excel. So they give them a test of Excel. There's like 30 minutes, see if they know where the menus are, so forth. So it's not hard to predict who's going to do better on this test. It would be Bob, because Bob knows the interface and he's learned these kind of straightforward things. The problem is, six months from now, who do you think is going to do, be doing better? Right? Here's this guy, Mike, who's learned these things on his own. He's put it together. He's going to get Excel and understand its deeper functions. So it's probably going to look like this. So in general, these performance tests that we give are not particularly diagnostic. So Aptitude tests in one study, aptitude tests predict about 9% of the variability in job performance immediately after training. So you train them up on Excel, give them a test, predicts about 9% of how they will do, and it drops to about 4% for final performance. So the test is a bad predictor to start with. And then over learning experiences, the test is really bad. So uh, Vygotsky, who's a famous developmental psychologist who's had a big influence on education, has this great quote uh, about assessment. So a gardener would proceed incorrectly if he considered only the ripe fruit in the orchard and did not know how to evaluate the condition of the trees that had not yet produced mature fruit. So these sequestered tests are really looking for the mature fruit, right? But they're not paying attention how well the tree's growing. They're just looking at it's sort of what's matured. And if you do that, you're sort of making a mistake. <clears throat> so this led to something called dynamic assessment. It was an alternative to IQ tests. So IQ tests were originally designed to help, help teachers uh, objectively identify kids who were having problems in the classroom so they could then go get resources. So IQ tests weren't really meant to say, you're really brilliant. They were meant to help sort the bottom end. This guy Feuerstein said, your IQ tests are asking the wrong thing. They should be asking whether these kids can learn, not do they have naked intelligence. And so the way he would do his IQ test is he would try and teach the kid how to do the problems in the IQ test and then see would they learn so they do better on the next problem. Turned out this was, very, this was a better diagnosis of the kid's abilities to go into school and benefit from it. It also turned out teaching them during the test led to better learning. So it was a good idea. So why do we want dynamic assessments? Uh, so I met with a group of superintendents. Uh, these are very powerful people, very important. They do, you know, determine the fate of schools. They're probably the loneliest people around. Right? They're really sort of put upon. And uh, so I was meeting with them, and I explained to them I'm a psychologist. And they all recoiled sort of quickly. And I pointed out, not that kind. Uh, and I said, no, I study learning. Right? And, and I'd try and figure out how to help people learn. And I asked them, what could I do for you? you know, what would you like? And I expected them, uh, naively, because you know, I, I used to be a teacher and the superintendent was kind of the enemy because he's my boss. Uh, I naively expected them to say, get our kids to do better on the state achievement tests. Right? And this is not what they said. All of them said the same thing. Right? So they're, they're not, they want their kids to do well on the achievement test, but they have something else in mind. They want to make these children independent citizens. Uh, so for most instruction, we care about whether students will be prepared to adapt and learn, not just what they mastered in the past. And so ideally, I could have helped the superintendents find out how they're doing in putting their kids in a position to adapt and learn, but we don't have tests that do that because they're all sequestered. They're all looking at mastery of the past, not potential for the future. Or how to take action if you're not doing well. 
So I think we need dynamic assessments that can measure whether students are prepared for future learning. So consider law school. Uh, law school uh, does not teach the California code, right, because you have students from Connecticut at Stanford. What do they want the California code for? Uh, law school prepares students to learn the California code on their own. And so to do that, every, every student takes the Barbary course. He does California. The Barbary course is kind of this amazing thing. You get this mountain of books, right? And like there's test prep questions, there's summary, there's reviews of cases, there are videos you can watch, there are like support groups where you have conversations, there's lectures you can attend. It's a massive amount of stuff. By my count, just a rough estimate, it was about 800 hours. And it's all redundant, right? It's like the video saying the same thing as the book, saying the same thing as the test thing. And really, the question is whether students are prepared to learn what, what given these resources. Right? This is really what this is going on. So in some ways, the bar exam is a preparation, a dynamic assessment, if you consider this part as part of the assessment. Basically, they have to pick and choose what to read and what, what's best for them. Or we could consider life. Here's a graph of the amount of time, uh, a rough estimate of the amount of waking hours you spend in school in the red compared to the amount of waking hours you spend outside of school. Uh, of course, graduate students, this, this does not mean the amount of time you're studying. It's just the amount of time you're in classes. I know you're studying 70, 80 hours a week. So you can see this isn't a tremendous amount of time in schools. The idea that in a school we're going to train students for everything that's going to possibly happen in the blue seems like a misconception, right? That really what we want to do is prepare students, give them stuff in the red so when they go in the blue, they can keep learning because the blue is going to keep changing. They're growing older. They're adapting. So the idea that we want to see how are we preparing students for future learning seems like an important goal. So we can have an alternative to this sequestered format. And this is uh, preparation for future learning. And so the question is, what can students learn during an assessment? So we give them something to learn from during the test. So let me just give a, uh, these, these PFL assessments can be very diagnostic. For example, they can tell you the benefit of one kind of learning experience over another. Let me just give a quick example. Uh, you may have seen this uh, every couple of years. The, uh, a reporter goes and finds a recent undergraduate from Harvard. You know, they've got their mortarboard on, maybe a little tipsy, and, and they say to them, so what causes the seasons to change? Right? And the Harvard student, you know, I don't know, the Earth's closer to the sun. The weather's bad. Is that what it does? And they look, they look kind of stupid, right? And the reporter's kind of smug, and the implication is, you know, a Harvard education doesn't buy you much more than a high school one, because they make the same mistakes. Well, this is kind of a SPS test, right? Sequestered, they didn't get a chance. We can turn this into a PFL assessment pretty quickly. We give them a day to learn the answer. And then you suspect the Harvard students would do much better, right? If we gave them a chance to learn, they'd probably be able to tell you yeah, something to do with the tilt and the angle of incidence, and they probably learned Kepler's law and everything else. So it's not hard to turn a sequestered test into a uh, preparation for future learning one. So let me give uh, an example from a study we did. Uh, we took over Palo Alto High School, uh, all of ninth grade algebra classes, and we taught them statistics. And uh, one group we taught with my secret sauce, this sort of guided discovery kind of instruction that's a way for them to really get it. And we got them from means up to standard deviations in about a week, week and a half. The other group got kind of the standard instruction. You know, you, you, you're told what to do. You're sort of, it, we explain it the best we can, and then you practice. You do a bunch of practice problems. So this was a lot of curriculum. And so at the end of it, you know, I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I probably measure more than I teach. And so we give them, like, you know, this 30-page post-test. And it's at the back of it is this problem that's hard. It's sort of just beyond the edge of what we've taught them, right? And so we want to see how they do on this problem. So uh, we look at the two groups, and we can see that they do about the same, right? And so the, yeah, use either type of instruction. It doesn't matter. This is a sequestered problem-solving test. Now let me switch it to a PFL. So we did this tricky little thing. Half the students 
in the guided discovery, and half the students in the tell and practice got a slightly different test. In their test on about page 10, there was this worked example that sort of talks about how can you compare your steals to your, the baskets you make, and this has to do with like standardized scores and stuff. And it gave this worked example, and then underneath it was a problem they had to follow. And they thought this was part of the test, right? And both groups did quite well at this. The performance was about 95%, so these are good kids. Uh, and so the question is, the trick here is that the worked example in the middle of this test, they didn't know they were supposed to be learning from it, actually held the keys to how to solve this one down here. And so, and so the question is, did they learn anything from it? Were they prepared to learn? And so what we find for the tell and practice is that these students weren't prepared to learn from the worked example, right? So didn't do much for it. They didn't learn anything. They looked exactly the same. The ones who had my secret sauce instruction learned a lot from this worked example, even though there was nothing in there telling them you need to know this for something later. So these PFL assessments, they can sort of pick up differences that the standard test can't, like that. Uh, yes? For the overall test, only one so, out? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, in, we work with schools. Sometimes we give tests, and the teachers are kind of angry because they want all the kids to get 100% on the test. But you know, if we made it so that people got 100%, then we couldn't compare treatments. So generally, our goal is to make a problem that's about 50% of the kids will get. That way, we optimize our chances of finding a difference. This was really a tough problem, also. But uh, what was the uh, duration between uh, when you started teaching them and then the post test? Uh, this post test was about ten days after. And, and they were continuously learning in those ten days. Or no, no, no. It was like we did our instruction for about two weeks and then we disappeared. And, days and, then and then we came back and gave them this test. Uh, we we've done it where we've looked out months later and we get effects like this. But here, the point is, and I, I mean, I didn't tell you how I taught. I didn't tell you my secret sauce. That's not what this, this lecture is. Uh, here, the point is just these kinds of assessments where you look at whether students are prepared to learn are quite sensitive to things that are missed. So there's a lot of people who think, this is the right way to teach. Let's give a video lecture and then have kids practice problems, for example. Uh, and it looks really good if you give a certain kind of test. Basically, if the test has problems, it looks just like the practice problems. If you give a different kind of test, those lectures may not look so good, right? And this is part of the game here, is we need to get assessments that allow us to be more, uh, better titration of good instructional experiences. Okay, so now I'm gonna try something even more radical. I've just argued that the static sequestered tests are bad, you wanna do preparation for future learning, now I'm going to argue, actually, the basic thing you think you're measuring is the wrong thing to measure. So I think a lot of people think that the outcome of learning is knowledge. I, that's great. I'm glad you know a lot. Uh, that's an important outcome. But you have to remember, assessment is a practical endeavor. It's not a scientific one. We do assessments for normative reasons, to help decide what's important, to help people learn what's important, to make decisions about importance. I don't think knowledge is actually what we care about as the outcome. I mean, it's good to have, but I just don't think it's what you should measure. Knowledge assessments are good. They're an advance over brute performance. So back in the day, you used to just see, could people do exactly the trained skill you gave them? Now we try and sort of measure their mental models, their schemas. We make reference to the knowledge constructs that they might have in their head. Uh, and so I think this has been a great advance over the behaviorist days when we really looked at just narrow training behavior. Now we're trying to make inferences about what's in their head. But the problem is knowledge without choice is inert. You know, if you have knowledge and you don't take action, who cares? Right? So I, I'm, I'm going to very quickly give you some reasons to let go of knowledge. This is, this is a tougher one to swallow. Uh, and if you, if you find it interesting, I got a long paper that sort of goes after it. But one is that knowledge is sort of isolated from change. Knowledge tends to be a description of a static state. I know it. I don't know it. Sometimes people try and get fancy and they say knowing in action, but it's still kind of a static state. It's like you got this knowledge that you're somehow applying. 
That's why you get the learning paradox. How could you learn something if you don't know where to look or how to tell if you've seen it? Right? It's just, it's knowledge is a description of a state. And we really want descriptions of change, of process. A second problem is that knowledge is isolated from situations. Uh, people think you carry knowledge around in your head, and it doesn't really matter what context you're in. You and HCI very well know that context makes a tremendous difference. So a description of what I kn know, independent of the kinds of contexts where I use it, is no description at all. Third issue is knowledge tends to be isolated from the rest of the person. It's kind of like a soul. Right? You have this knowledge that stands independent of the rest of you. And so the, in my area, sort of the, one of the top journals is Cognitive Science, which really looks at knowledge. And you may find one article on motivation in that journal over 30 years. Right? So that we assess knowledge, but we don't assess things like motivation, right? which is probably quite important. Finally, uh, this is more sort of esoteric, but knowledge is isolated from the rest of the social sciences. Besides artificial intelligence and psychology, you know, you don't really hear economists talking about knowledge. They're talking about choices that people make. Sociologists are talking about the choices that people make, right? It's, we, we sort of, in education at least, we talk about knowledge, but it's very hard to connect up. So I have an economist who looks at school choice, and I'd like to say what that has to do with students' knowledge, and they're talking about choice, and I'm talking about knowledge, and so we kind of have a mismatch, right? And there would be, it would be nice if we weren't so isolated. So I want to replace knowledge with choice as the target outcome of learning. So I want to put choice as the central construct of learning and assessment. The goal is not to measure their knowledge. The goal is to measure their choices. And so I think almost all Western scholarship of significance is about choice. This is a quote from Rousseau that I love. Uh, the problem is to find a form of association in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone remain as free as before. The question is, how can we put constraints in which people are able to make intelligent choices and have the freedom to do so? It's the central issue. Uh, I think adaptive choices are the main goal of education. Parents want their kids to make good choices. The degree to, they want them to get good grades is largely so that they'll be in a position to be able to have more choices that they can make. The grades. Don't, get, don't fetishize about the grades, right? They're a way to get somewhere. Educators care about choice. Uh, the number of arguments you hear in education about putting kids in constructivist environments uh, as opposed to being told what to do, these are ultimately issues of choice, right? They want kids to have agency to make choices, right? And the reason, you heard it from the superintendents. So they'll be able to make intelligent choices when they leave school. Society, I think, cares about choice. This is why we vote, right? It's all about making choices, deciding where to spend our money. Not a very profound choice, but important one. Uh, it also turns out that interest in eighth grade science predicts whether you get a bachelor in science better than your academic achievement, your standardized tests. So interest, and the reason interest makes a difference is because interest drives the choices you make. So interest is a better predictor of learning than knowledge, at least as measured by achievement tests. Finally, choice is inherently dynamic. It's a process construct rather than being static. So I want to be really clear about this, because uh, sometimes there's confusions. Educators focus on choice as a way to increase motivation. right? So this views choice as an input to instruction. If I let kids choose between one of three games to one of three lessons will be more motivated than if I just give them one. Right? This is viewing choice as an input to instruction. Here, I'm making a different argument. I want to measure choice as the outcome of instruction. Right? Whether, what, when, how students choose. So I believe the outcome of school is educated choice, not knowledge. So let me give a quick example of uh, knowledge versus choice in assessment. This is a little game we gave to uh, your forebearers, your forerunners, I guess, like four years ago before you came to Stanford. But it could have been you. And uh, basically, this is uh, the semantics of an operator. Uh, the diamond is a kind of operator. And when you combine two elements, you get a value in a square. So here, R must be the, is probably the identity element. 
because when you combine R and Q, you get Q again, right? And maybe you get R, you get P here, R there. This, this operator happens to be the mod operator, right? And so students basically went through and they would click on squares and make their guess as to what it was, what belonged in the square. And that was sort of the game that they had to do. Make sense? So uh, we did a knowledge assessment, which is the number of correct answers that they got on the squares. And we did a choice-based assessment. We looked at which square did they choose. We didn't care whether they got it right or wrong. And then, after that, we gave them a new problem that had a new operator. It wasn't the mod operator. I forget what it was. But a new problem that was sort of the same format. And the question is, what's going to predict performance on that? Their accuracy or their choices? So it turns out that prior choice and knowledge is measured by accuracy, which is how we usually measure knowledge. Both predicted performance on the transfer. Choice predicted about twice as well. Right, so in this case, the choices they made for how to go about learning predicted their subsequent performance better than their accuracy during learning. How? Because if you know what you're doing, you don't just ask random choices, right? You sort of check columns. You track down patterns. So you're looking for rows and columns. Uh, as it turns out, there's a third condition where they learned this grid, but they never made choices. We chose the squares for them, and they did the worst on the transfer task. Right, so here's a case where choice improves learning and the measurement of choice allows you to detect the effects of choosing to learn. So knowledge versus choice. I think knowledge guides choice, but uh, choice determines learning and much more. And I think we should measure where the rubber meets the road. Uh, but it's interesting. As, as assessments get closer to what we care about, they start to become more dangerous. There's something safe about knowledge measuring cold cognition and cold knowledge. When we start measuring choices, uh, me when you measure an assessment, it implies you it have some intent to manage, right? And so as you get closer, you sort of begin to worry about evaluating people's choices. Like, do we really want to be measuring political choices, religious choices, right? It's, it becomes a little scary, which allows me to know that I'm getting close to what matters. So we tried to sort of cordon this off so that it doesn't explode. So there are, we can find the assessments to learning relevant choices, right? as opposed to choices of uh, what religion to adopt and so forth. Still, I think there's danger in here. And this is true with any, if you go and you teach school, you're basically making decisions about what students should know and learn. Right? So you're imposing it. Here, we're just calling a spade a spade. We're deciding what choices they're going to make, because we want them to make these choices because we think they're better. OK, so now we get closer to issues of computer science, where it could help. So uh, we've been making choice-based assessments that we call choicelets. And uh, students complete games. And they need to learn something new to play well in the game. Uh, we measure their choices. We like track their clicks. And uh, so these choice-based assessments are natural for computers. Right? And so here's an example of one that was on uh, persistence. Uh, these eighth grade children could play any of five brief games on genetic inheritance. Right? So they're basically traveling to planets and playing games that involve Punnett squares. And they could play the same game multiple times, uh, or they could switch from planet to planet any time they wanted. And they tried to accrue points. If they lost a game, they lost one of their five lives. And, uh, and the thing was, is they needed to learn something new because these, they didn't know this biology. They knew Punnett squares, but you can get really complicated in these things with recessive and dominant. And so we included resources to help. These included like readings, uh, precise feedback. So after they do one, it would tell them why they got it wrong and so forth. And so this would be an example of one of the games. I, I don't actually think this particular game was very much fun despite the word family tree fun. Uh, but that's OK. You know, some games are better than others. And so kids would try and solve this, right? And then they'd click on finish. So they've gone to this planet, and they've chosen to do this one. And then afterwards, they get a screen that sort of gives them their score. 
and then ask them what they want to do next. Do they want to play again? Do they want to go to the resources? Do they want to see answers for this game so they can sort of check their answers versus what was the right answer? Do they want to try a different game, that is, go to another planet, do a different game, or do they opt out altogether and say, I'd like to design an alien? Uh, nobody did this, so, which is good because we didn't really have anything particularly good there for designing <laughs> an alien. So the question is, do their choices diagnose anything interesting about their learning? So uh, the critical choice here was abandonment after failure. Here, by abandonment, I mean they played a game, they lost. Do they leave that planet and go to another one? And if that happens, we call that abandonment after failure. If they stick with it, try and get it right, that's not abandonment. If they got it right, then there's no chance for abandonment. Okay, so it's basically how often do kids switch games when they fail? So it turns out abandonment predicted 50% of learning from the game. Uh, students, we gave them a little post-test afterwards on genetic inheritance. So that, that sort of makes sense, right? If you quit, you're not going to learn it. The more interesting part is it also explained 33% of the variation in the kids' science classes. Right? So this assessment is picking up a lot of information. Right? The, the, the sorts of things that predict this at this level are usually how they did on an earlier test that look almost identical. Right, this is sort of the story in school. You did well in fifth grade in reading. You can do well in sixth grade in reading. You get this sort of level of explanation. So abandonment after failure was better predictor than the rate of failure. It was a better predictor than their standardized test scores. And it was a better predictor of pretest scores. So in this case, choice, not knowledge, was the important variable for how these kids are doing in their science classes. Basically, there's a bunch of kids who quit when they fail, and they're really at risk. So here's another one, a second example. This is a choice-based assessment of critical thinking. So critical thinking is the process by which people decide what to believe. And uh, most of these assessments end up evaluating reasoning as opposed to really the, the process by which people decide what to believe. And usually they're deductive things like uh, the ability to recognize when assumptions do not lead to conclusions. So uh, they're never connected to learning outcomes, right? They never try and connect critical thinking to anything. You don't have to learn during the assessment. So what happens is critical thinking tends to get confused with deductive reasoning on one hand and sort of brute intelligence on the other, right? And it sort of misses the thrust of critical thinking, which is the process by which people decide what to believe. Here's a typical critical thinking measure. Uh, the top part is a statement, and then you have to choose among these. I'll let you experience this. It'll be familiar. All right, it's enough. I, I know. I know the audience, you guys all want to get it right, and you want to know what the answer is so you can prove that you're smart and you got it right. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So we decided to take critical, th critical thinking and change it. So that's really dry. Kids who are bad at reading, it's, it, it'll crucify them. Right? It's just, it's really, it's, it is deductive reasoning. We wanted to get back, it's the process by which people decide what to believe. So we decided to examine the choices to engage in it. That is the process by which they go about deciding what to believe. And uh, the game involved learning about red, green, blue, mixing light. And so all kids know subtractive color, uh, red, yellow, and blue, like mixing finger paints. They know the primaries. I know it's CMY. But for these kids, it's red, yellow, blue. Uh, but they don't know additive color, you know, for the RGB. They don't know that red and green make yellow, that uh, red, red plus green make orange. Right, so they don't know this, and it, once, it took me a while to wrap my head around this, because it's sort of like, no, the primaries, you can't make yellow out of something else, so it takes a while to wrap your head around it. And so the students had to engage in critical thinking and decide what to believe about light. They have all this prior knowledge, right? And, and then we give them some resources. So this is a PFL assessment. It's a preparation for future learning. We give them resources to learn, and we see their choices and whether they do them. So this is the environment. 
that we did it in. Uh, it, the middle panel is a game. There's several levels to it. This is, I think, the hardest level. And what they do is they click on a color up there, and it comes down here, and then they decide which colors to put here, so they'll mix to make the target color that they put here. If they mix the right colors, uh, the target disappears, and their goal is to figure out the rebus or the secret message. If they get the wrong answer, the value of the square dropped from 20 points to 10 points. They get the wrong answer again. The square has no value, but they still need to get it off, right, so they can figure out what the rebus is. Sort of the basic play pattern makes sense. They're mixing colors to try and remove squares. So we gave them some resources. Here we gave them the deluxe chart catalog. Uh, that the front of it says buyer beware. And so here, there's uh, different charts. And uh, this chart shows how to mix paint, right? And somewhere in here, there's some charts about how to mix light, right? And so they have to decide which of these charts to believe. There's also down here a little experiment room so they can drag colors in and mix them, right? And so they can figure out what the answer is that way. And so, you know, if you're an attentive student, you might notice that this does not look like that, that chart over there. So you'd sort of realize, wait a minute, I've got to figure out what's going on here. What should I believe? Does it make sense what the task and everything is? Okay. So this was sixth graders. They played the game for about 15 minutes. They liked it. You know, it's fun. It's, we can make it funner, but it was fun. Uh, and we looked at their choices to predict their classroom grades in mathematics. So is this a good assessment? So something that might be surprising to you is the frequency of correct answers with that experiment room over here predicted low class grades. Right? Basically what they're doing is they're doing trial and error to freedom. Right? They're mixing things, they're finding it, they stumble on it and they go, okay, I'll just mix these and put them there. So they're not thinking, they're just getting the right answers. Turns out, the amount of time you spent looking at the wrong catalog predicted high math class grades. Right? So the amount of time you spend looking at the wrong thing is a good predictor of how well you do in math, where you do better. Basically, they're, trying, they're spending a lot of time looking at this, trying to figure out what they should believe. So again, we see these choices. This is a very high level of prediction again. These choices are really telling us something about their math grades. Uh, it's interesting to figure out what might be going on in class that this thing's indexing that's causing these kids to learn poorly. Uh, we haven't done that. You know, we do assessment, which means we don't have to look at kids, really. But, but we should. And so you can imagine, I'm a kid who's talking to another kid, and I ask him what the answer is. And that kid tells me, and I just write it down. That'd be sort of these kids, right? It, they may have given me an answer that's different than mine but I trust them, so I just write it down. The kids who do the catalog, they tell me their answer is different, and I try and figure out which of us is right. right. So this might be one way this sort of thing that the assessment's picking up would cash out in the classroom. So now we can bring in HCI. So computers and assessment. Here's option one. We can measure the wrong thing only faster, and in a very computer science way, make sure everyone has access to the bad thing. Right, we, we could do this. Uh, a great example of this is adaptive testing. Uh, you, you may have taken a test like this. It, it's not adaptive in any interesting way. It's basically a way to make the test shorter. You get an answer right, it gives you a harder one. You get an answer wrong, it gives you an easier one. And that way it can calibrate sort of your level of sequestered problem solving skills very quickly. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched someone take a test, but you may have had this experience. Right? You, just, you sort of, you got an easier problem, you go, uh-oh, my, you know, my GRE just dropped or something. <laughs> so uh, there's a quote from a guy who's very big in the assessment area that I really love. He, he sort of captures it. I'll just let you read this instead of me. So I, I prefer the computer science community to help us do new right things instead of fast wrong things. And so I think this is option two. And so I'm going to say four places where I think 
uh, HCI could help. I don't, I don't know HCI very well. I read Terry's book, his, uh, one of his books, as a graduate student. It wasn't enough to become an expert. It was great. It wasn't enough. Um, so one is to help us design assessment environments for good user interactions. So this is sort of a low-hanging fruit for you guys. Uh, the thing is, is current tests have these very well-worn scripts. Everybody knows the script. They know multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank, et cetera. So when they take the test, they know what they're supposed to do. There's no confusions. As we start to make these interactive tests, they require novel interactions. And so these things need to be designed and tested, right? A simple mistake. If, if there's something wrong with the interface and it drives the interaction wrong, it's really going to muddy up the assessment because we're going to be picking up the kid, sort of trying to figure out some mistake we made in the menuing as opposed to their attempts to learn what we care about. So I think this is something where it would be uh, a natural. Uh, we work on these things, but we're rookies. Uh, here's our second iteration of uh, what we call Lightlit, the, the test you saw before. This is the new version. It's called Idlet, right? And uh, basically, you have to mix colors for singers. If you mix the wrong color, the singer stops, and they sort of get voted off the stage. But you can see that the charts are over here again. But you know, we're just slopping around. We don't, we don't know what we're doing. But it's a lot of fun. So this is one place that, that I think is easy. It's it sort of, in some ways, it's below you. But it would be really helpful. Uh, a second one is uh, a little more profound. We need methods of validating assessments. So there's two parts to this. You know, in uh, knowledge, you know, there's not really much of a question about whether they got it right or wrong. Right, a kid does 2 plus 2 equals 5, you sort of say, that's wrong, because right? you can refer to knowledge. Choices is a little tougher. Right? If I give a choice-based test, and then some kid takes some series of choices, and I want to say it's better, you're probably going to say to me, no, I don't think so. And I have to find some way to validate that it really is a better choice. Right? Whereas with knowledge, you, sort of, you don't have to do that. Here we need a way to validate this. And so uh, one, one thing that we're looking at and we could use help is uh, sort of A-B testing uh, and crowdsourcing. So can you validate assessments when you don't actually know who the people are that are taking them? And I, I actually think there's a way to do this, and this is sort of my naive approach. So imagine I have some game that has three levels, level one, level two, level three. And I sort of put points in there or something that kind of drives half the B group towards choices B, which I think are good for learning, and I have some inducements for people to do choices A, which I think are bad for learning, right? And, and so I, I, I measure these to make sure I'm getting the choices that I expect. And then level three is actually a test of how much they learned. And then I can sort of say, these people who took these good choices in these conditions, if they look better here, then I have a warrant that this is a good, a good pattern of choice, that I validated whatever the particular choice pattern is. So this is sort of one place. Uh, it's an interesting problem. How do you validate assessments when you don't get to see people? Also, you need lots. You need lots of people right, for, to do assessments. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, uh, we've had some success collaborating on sort of crowdsourcing to evaluate different types of instruction, like parallel, parallel versus serial design with Scott Klemmer and Stephen Dow when he was here. So I think there's a lot of potential here but I don't have the expertise. Uh, a third one, which I think is just fundamentally difficult, um, is computer-aided data abstraction. So when we design these assessments, we sort of have an a priori prediction about what are the telling patterns, what are the right choices, and what are the wrong choices. And we can go after them and look for them. But a lot of times, there's other patterns to be discovered in the data. Right? You can imagine these kids playing the that light light game, you know, they've made 100, 150 choices, and they're all in a sequence, right? And so data mining would be really useful here. But before you can do it, you've got to do this abstraction, right? You've got to turn the clicks into meaningful events. And uh, this is really a difficult problem. It's, uh, so for example, I might want to code this as a particular kind of event that's very important. Student failed, they open catalog one, they close catalog one within two seconds, and then they redid the problem and failed again. Right? This, you might characterize this as the kid's looking for a quick fix and not paying attention, something like that, and they're not learning. The problem is I identify this as a key pattern, 
So I want to count this as the same kind of pattern. It's the exact same thing, except there's another event within it. Right? And I sort of want to include that as the pattern before, but now I have this difficulty of how to specify this. Right? This sort of level of abstraction. How do I discover this is what I want, and then how do I specify the level of ab abstraction? So I, I think at this point in the state of the art, deciding what's a meaningful abstraction is still a human affair. Um, and so I think computers can support human induction. So they, they so this is a sort of a great place for HCI. Uh, so one possibility that we're starting to explore is we have a playback feature that allows you to watch each event running through, each child. You see all their clicks. And uh, you can click on things. At, at a, you can stop it. You click on these various state variables, like, and I'll show you in a second. And then the system goes and it looks through the full data corpus across everybody. And it pulls up other instances that look like that. And it says, is this what you meant? And I, as the researcher, sort of say, not these ones, these ones, right? And then the system tries to refine the query that way, right? And slowly, and, or I may realize I've missed. And I think over some iteration, we can get some abstract spe uh, specification in place. And this involves some heuristics about what are the sorts of things that humans are normally looking for in this environment. Of course, we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, so this would be sort of the start. Here's that environment. Up there you can see I can start from anywhere in the event, in the stream. We already have low-level events coded to a certain level. I can set the speed. So I might say, boy, I'm really interested in this and this. And then the computer will come up and you know, maybe it sort of says, do you care about the fact that they're the same color or do you care that they're uh, pale blue? Right? And slowly work through and then eventually it'll come up with instances and I'll realize, no, no, I really meant it when, when the catalog was closed. And so I identify that and you can sort of see how this would go. It's a tough problem. Right? But I, I think it's a huge bottleneck in all the data mining that's going on that the, these clicks are very low level and you need some abstraction before. Most of the people who have had success with educational data mining have already abstracted the data before they even started. So they really know what they're looking for and so they're not really data mining. Lastly, I'd like to know what HCI would like to assess. You know, so we're looking for interesting things to assess. Um, and so what are sort of the choice based out based outcomes for an HCI course or for hiring an HCI person? What, what kind of situation where they have something to learn would you like to see the kinds of choices? I think design in general is a really interesting space. So good designers are client and stakeholder center. They hear what the client is, they get feedback, they iterate, but they also talk to the stakeholders who are going to get the product. They try and figure it all out. So I can make an assessment that sees, do HCI students in design show a greater tendency to choose to see feedback and input than non-HCI students. And you could find out, are you being successful at teaching them to do this, or are you just being successful at teaching them to say this? So uh, here's a final thought that I just added just now. Uh, so just to recap, tests greatly influence what people think matters. They shape national and local policy. Uh, they shape instruction and teacher practices. They shape student beliefs about useful learning. Uh, I think current tests are a mismatch and a mismeasurement of what we care about and what matters mo most. I think dynamic uh, assessments of choices are better, and I think it's possible to do this, but it, it's going to take some work. And so finally, you know, assessment is a big deal, and its goal should be to advance the goals of society rather than misrepresent them because the state of the art is designed in such a way that it misrepresents what we care about. And so, I think uh, technology, it should be possible to advance these goals in new ways, right, rather than entrenching old ways of doing it that were never that good, but were there for technological reasons. I think this is where HCI can help. I suggested a couple things, help with the interactive designs, validation schemes, data abstraction, and design is a big deal, right, and a lot of people would like to know how do we assess designerly thinking. So finally, thank you. And Is this, is this how we do it? This question to you straight. So I'll ask a starting question. You made the point in this slide that uh, teachers are going to teach to the test, whatever the yeah. test is. 
you said oh, we have a new kind of assessment here. What would the curriculum like look like if teachers were teaching to this test? Yeah. So imagine that. So assuming that we're not gaming, right? If the test requires the student to learn a new concept, skill, talent, you're going to have to teach in a slightly different way because you don't quite know what the content, skill, talent is. And so you're going to have to try and teach the student so they have a deep enough understanding that they're prepared to learn the next, the next concept. You're probably also going to need to teach them how to use resources to learn on their own. So they, these would be these are sort of the dreams, right? Is that now you're, you're thinking, my job is not to get them to just regurgitate or be able to handle these very stylized word problems. My, I don't quite know what they're going to get. My goal is to prepare them to learn when they get in that situation. So it could look very different. My guess is there'll be ways to game it. You know, that there could be fatal mutations, but hopefully not. Yes, sir? So there's a thing I've heard of called decision fatigue, where the more choices yeah. everyone has to make, will that be incorporated into learning at all? Uh, that's interesting. So yeah, Barry Schwartz at Swarthmore talks about this, where he, he shows that increasing the number of choices, uh, if you're a perfectionist, it makes you really unhappy. Right? Because you're sitting there going, well, no, no, I, you might have buyer's regret. Right? So you sort of worry that if we focus on choices too much, it, it would sort of be overwhelming. You know? But were you asking, how would I teach students to handle having lots of choices? It's a, I guess, a two-part question. Okay. Would that be incorporated into any part of the learning? And would that be a consideration and an assessment of that? Um, that like, maybe to measure their perseverance uh, through extended amounts of choices. You mean, do they quit making choices and just curl up? Yeah. Is that, is that the image? That I have so many choices, I'm done, and I'm just shut down? Yeah. If this is a problem, then it's something we should address. I, I don't know that that happens to me in my life, except for like, if I'm talking to my significant other about where we should go to dinner. You know, and then it's just like, just decide. Come on, just I can't. Uh, but it could be. It could be an important part of the curriculum. I think you know, the ways they sort of try and address that is by helping people prioritize you know, how to organize this choice space so that you can actually navigate it without being crushed by it. You know. Yeah, yeah, being able to throw out and say, that, boy, that's a dumb choice. I shouldn't or, worry. Uh, it doesn't matter where we go to eat. This, this choice is not one worth investing time in. This choice is one that needs a careful yeah. collaborative process. So there's this uh, great study by Hazel Marcus. Uh, I don't know if she ever published it. She talked about a study. There's, she brings people into a room, and there's like, uh, it's a study, and there's like five identical rooms. And in each room, there's an identical table. And there's five different sheets of paper, different colors, which all say the same thing, five colored pens, and a bowl of candy. And people go in, and they sit down, and they do this thing. They just put them in, and they fill out a questionnaire. And the question is, afterwards, you ask them, how many choices did you make? And the American students, you know, they're like, oh, I made like 12, right? And uh, this, this one student, for example, said, well, yeah, I picked up one of the red candies, and I decided I didn't want it, so I grabbed another one. So that was three choices. Evidently, uh, Eastern Indians were sort of like, I think there was one choice, because they just didn't count as choices, right? They were inconsequential. So choice is kind of interesting, because it's socially constructed. It's not a thing. Yes, sir? So, uh, you for future learning. Uh, yeah. how, so how universal do you think that is as a trait, or is that very uh, specific to a domain? Do we really need to test? Uh, say something like mathematical ability versus critical thinking separately, or is this a transferable skill? And yeah, so, the, so the, you got a lot of fun and love in that one. Um, so generally, I'm not talking about innate abilities. I'm talking about things that are actionable through instruction, right? Otherwise, I don't really, why should I worry about it? Uh, you're kind of asking the question to transfer. So let's say it turns out one thing that you can train that affects lots and lots of things is attention. You know, it's very plastic. It's sort of the last thing to develop, the first thing to go, right? And so you can train this. And, it, and if you improve that, it affects lots of stuff. If I improve your math skills, it's probably not going to affect your ability to appreciate art very much, right? So the domain specificity of these, you probably need to stay pretty domain specific, you know? And, and how do you think, uh, what is the shortest possible test that you can imagine which 
will be a PFL, right? Because here you have at least two things. Two seconds. Okay. And how would you do that? What's that? How would you do that? Uh, I've made a museum exhibit. And one of the exhibits has whales. And I think this is going to create a spark of interest in children. So I put them in a website, and there's five rooms about different things, and one of them is about whales, and the kid can choose which door to go through. And he clicks whales, my exhibit worked. He's made a choice about his future learning by going into whales. And I've measured his interest. That was pretty fast. Yeah, you got you to let go of the thought of, I know what you're thinking, which is, you want to be assessing them doing something really complicated. No, uh, you want to be assessing them doing something which you care about specifically. And, you know, learning about whales is a broad skill where, you know, the, the child is saying he's curious and all yeah. of that. But really, if I want to know, if I'm hiring a web designer, uh, if I want to know if he's going to be good at learning web design. So here, here's, a, here's an assessment that we've done along those lines that works really well. You give them some specifications, and you say they can ask any questions they want. Watch what questions they ask. Right? So if you get sort of first-year engineering students, they ask very few. You get the high-end designers, they ask you questions about stakeholders, and eventually they start questioning even your specifications. Right? And so the questions that people ask is extremely diagnostic about where they are. Here, we don't actually measure whether they're learning, but the questions they ask is a good indicator of their preparation. Having them solve these sort of Yahoo-like problems, eh, you know, that's sort of, it's cute. and it probably weeds out people who don't know how to read or something. But. So I, I keep being troubled by the generic notion of choice. When you first said there's, you know, cognitive science and choice, thought, oh, behaviorism. Yeah. The rat goes left or it goes right. You don't know what's in its head. You just yeah. know what choice did it make. Yeah. Um, you might argue, for example, the best education for kids that choice is important to send them to the supermarket because they got 400,000 different products and so on and so on. And what you would say is choosing a particular cereal is the most interesting. It's choosing to read the nutrition label. Yeah. It's choice about a learning strategy, not yeah. just choice in a general sense. That's right. It's choice about learning. And so strategy would be one, you know, but sometimes if you're in the interest domain, right, it's choices about what to learn. If you're sort of in the metacognitive cognitive domain, it's how to learn, right? Uh, and to be able to make choices and be effective, you need to have some prior knowledge. But I think I can pick that up with the choices. Uh, it's not quite the same as behaviorism. Behaviorism was a strong theory about there's nothing in people's head. Uh, the choice that you can't know, I agree. And, there, and therefore, it's not worthy of scientific discussion. Uh, here, I'm agnostic. If you can predict choices by using people's knowledge, that's great. I don't care. Right? That's a scientific question. This is a normative one, which is sort of how do we frame the way we talk about learning. And I think knowledge is sort of a sign and an attempt at a scientific explanation of the behaviors people take. But that's a different endeavor than coming up with assessments that amplify what we consider important and measure it. But, but yeah, you know, so what's a good taxonomy of choice? Good question. Yes, ma'am. I have a, a puzzle that I've been trying to map to uh, issues about choice. Um, I'm interested not just in performance of an individual, but an individual machine system. So, for example, you're a, a pilot in a cockpit. Yeah. Let's take that kind of familiar realm, or you're a, a plant operator. And I want to know how do you design the system that you're interacting with that supports the person for, un for the unanticipated. So you can design to make the routine fluent, and that can be handy, because right. the less time you spend on that, the more time you have to do other things. Um, but what a lot of the sort of challenging problems concern are dealing with problems. In particular, the combination of failures. So like cockpits are designed yeah. to be one-tolerant failure, and you're taught what to do for each single failure, right? right? But the combinatorics of multiple failures are much too great to make that solution, ex you know, scale. So you want to design a system that allows the, the user to um, use it effectively in situations that neither he or she or the designer anticipated. And right. so you want to design it for making good choices in unknown circumstances. It's kind of a learning problem, 
how do I learn what this, how the system works, how things are put together, yeah. such that I have yeah. productive knowledge that can be read, that can transfer to new, yeah. to new situations. And uh, it feels like there's some kind of analogy in that you're designing for novel choice, but it's not just a learn, you know, it's not assessing how well an it's individual does, it's assessing how a system does. And your system is better if you have a few airplanes falling out of the sky, and that's a nice good criterion, although not very sensitive. Um, right, well, we'll, we can start with more, more uh, proximal outcomes. Sure. But, but right, so basically you want to see choice in the context of adaptation, right? And some, it's a, something, the variance, this is an outlier, how do you adapt to it? You would need to characterize, right? You have, be, have to be in a position to be able to say, these are better choices than those, right? And and what they are, I don't know. I mean, one of them. What a better choice is. No, no, if, well, if, if you can't rationalize it at all, then I can't do anything for you. You got to be able to say, oh, most people look for main effects. I need to treat, teach people how to handle interactions, right? And so I had this guy fix my furnace the other day, and his ability to check down the interactions was stunning. How did he do it? He had a spectacular model of how the system works, right? And that's how he pulled it. So that, that would be something you could teach, and a lot of people may not do spontaneously, and, and you could certainly measure that. Okay. okay Thank you. Great discussion. If you Thank you. Further, it's after two. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.